Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started with the presentation from our Heritage Tribal Office. Um, just a reminder, uh, I'm Louise Dixie, the Language and Culture Department, Cultural Resources Director. But I've asked uh, one of our departments, the Heritage Tribal Office, to do a presentation for us because not only do we um, have some major environmental issues that we deal with through Kelly Wright's office. We also have, we are sitting next to the Idaho National Laboratory, which is a nuclear, nuclear site. And the tribe has since 1994 entered into a working agreement with the Department of Energy to um, have oversight on our cultural resources and cultural sites that are located on the Idaho National laboratory area. So today, uh, and at the present time, we in 1994, up until the present, we've had a working agreement, but it's now called, we just entered in, in 2023, to a new agreement, it's called an agreement in principle. And um, I wanted to also point out that in 1994, Due to a lack of tribal consultation, Department of Energy entered into an agreement with the state of Idaho to store hazardous nuclear waste at the INL. So as a result of that, our business council took action and stopped nuclear waste, a nuclear waste train. And so that brought national attention and we had um, Department of Defense and Depart flew their Black Hawk helicopters here to Fort Hall to find out what these Indians were doing but they refused to work with our, our tribe. So the council took action to stop their train. So we'll have more, a little bit of that in the presentation. And the first presenter will be Kyle Denny, who is a cultural resources technician with the HITO department. And then Anna Bowers, who is also a cultural resources technician will be the second presenter, or no, I'm sorry, Larray Bale will be the second pre presenter. She's a cultural resources specialist, and then Anna Bowers will do the closing. So um, we appreciate your time and listening, and I'll let them go ahead and present. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. And um, I want to tell everybody thank you for coming here today um, and feel welcome here. While you're eating your uh, your food, that was prepared for you. I hope you enjoy it and uh, we can fill your ears with some good things, some good thoughts today. Um, again, like Louis said, my name is Kyle Denny. Uh, I'm a temporary uh, cultural resources lead tech for the cultural resources department and um, I was given an opportunity to present to you today. So I'm going to do the best that I can. Um, one question here is, do I have to tab through this or are you guys gonna tab for me? Okay, all right. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide then. Okay, I started off my uh, presentation here, kind of give you a, an idea of why we're, we're being, why we, be, why we came into existence here with this department. <clears throat> and so we all started with the Department of Energy and their, I guess, agreement that they have with the EPA or an understanding the, the laws that they got to follow. So they are moving into something called long ship, long term stewardship. And that's where the tribes come in. And we have entered into an agreement in principle with the Department of Energy, the tribe has. So currently, we have a new director. And I, I put it up there, Javette Tower Sap, and she's our new director. So I want to wish her a little congratulations today as she's here for her new position. And she's got lots to learn, just like I do. And uh, we're going to do the best that we can. And so this chain here kind of gives you an idea of how this agreement in principle goes through each department that we have in the cultural resources 
language and cultural preservation department. And so you got the top and you got the specialist in Larray. And then I sit underneath her as the temporary tech and you've got environmental monitoring underneath her and Jamie Eagle speaker, Leo Eagle speaker and Jeremy Hernandez. And, and some of my staff here or my coworkers are here. And if I do misstate anything, go ahead and feel free to come on up and uh, correct me or wave your hand at me. Um, so we move into that first phase of the department that I work with. And then we have the cultural preservation department that works underneath not only Yvette, but works underneath uh, Luis as well. And so uniquely, we have two different perspectives that are kind of governing us with what we do on a, a daily basis by representing the Shoshone tribes and our interests out there, our concerns, uh, the sites that they have. So that's, that's where we're at with that. We also are into developing our own energy resources, which is part of that agreement and principle. And so Atlanta Baldwin represents that department and that future there. Uh, we also have the air quality under Lori Howell, Shana Martin, Leela Abrahamson, and Joey De La Cruz. Those are the four departments that I know of that I work with on a, a daily basis in some shape, form, or fashion. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I want to give you a little bit of a back history as to where we're at right now. But to take to tell you about today, I got to tell you why it is. And that's the creation of the tribes. And that began way before our time uh, with the, the Fort Bridger Treaty of 1868. And uh, Shoshone Bannocks are very proud of that treaty. We're very proud because that treaty was a peace treaty, meaning we entered into it with the government because we wanted peace. And so that is very significant and very notable that I want you to take away from today that the Fort Hall Indian, Indian Reservation was created because of that, a peace treaty. So at that time, when it was first signed, the reservation size was huge, 1. million acres, and then some. Today, that reservation's been reduced and it's been reduced through a series of unceded land acquisitions by the federal government. We're just over half half million acres today. So we've lost, what would you call that? Half of our reservation and then some 70%, 60%. Um, so that that is key right now uh, it'll, I'll go into it later on as to where we're at and this next caption here, the tension with the federal, the state and the local governments continue to that and to this day. Go ahead and go on to the next one. I want to I wanna fast forward to the creation of the, the Naval Proving Grounds established by the Atomic Energy Commission in 19... 49, which is now known as INEL, or INL, excuse me. That and that acquisitions and those seated, acquis uh, unseated acquisitions is, is why we have this agreement in principle partially today as well. So things begin to change as time went on. And with that, well, let me back up here. Let me back up. I'm getting ahead of myself. When they brought out the INEL Naval Proving Grounds, that stopped, that stopped something. It stopped, it stopped tribal members from being able to go out that way and um, be able to go to a place they might know, uh, visit a historical area, maybe a religious site. And that was something that was not okay with the tribes at that time. And um, I want to mention something. I had to give an opportunity to um, be a part of a, a tour out there. And this is just a little side note on my behalf as something that I was taught growing up. Uh, it was simple as a plant, simple as a plant. And we were talking with these uh, federal uh, government uh, people out there, and they were touring us and making a presentation of what 
was going to happen to that area, that site there. And um, they wanted the tribal input on that. And, and that's partly why we're there uh, with that with that whole agreement with the DOE and the agreement in principle and the long term stewardship program that's identified in that. So it was as simple as the plant and this plant is used for many different mm, purposes. Could be for prayers, it could be for health, uh, for food, um, for a cold or a sickness. And they wanted to know what we thought of that site. And so um, just something like that, I thought, and I told those people, I said, hey, there's something here that's significant and I want you to want to tell you about it. So I told them about it and, and how special that plant was because it doesn't go everywhere. And so that site has it there. And I just wanted them to know that. And so in some small way, I was able to, you know, maybe uh, put that in their head that going forward, that we would be very concerned if their activities in that place would be uh, detrimental to that plant. So again, that goes back to stopping a way of life at the, the, the INEL started when they started no access you can't come out here you can't you can't come hunting you can't come gathering you can't go fishing you know it's something hard to take but that's the way it was and moving into today within the last my time frame in the last 30 40 years things have changed and they started changing with laws and regulations and executive orders and so i mentioned a few of these up here and I don't know them all, I'll tell you that right now. There's so many of them. And they all go by these long, these long uh, titles here. And they all have these small things here. They call them acronyms and there's four letters and I'll never remember them for probably another year. But I wanna mention these, these, uh, these orders or these acts or these laws because they're, they're key as to why things changed. Um, uh, they put procedures or policies in place that forced the federal government to come to the table with the tribes and negotiate and consult with this and not just bypass this. So these things are, are very important as to why we are here today talking about what, everything that we're talking about. So some of those things are the National Historic Preservation Act, NHPA. We got the Archaeological Historic Preservation Act, AHPA, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Go ahead and go to the next slide. We have an executive order and it's identified as 11593, Protection and Enhancement of Cultural Environments. We have another executive order, 13175, consultation and coordination with Indian tribal governments, and executive order, 13007, Indian sacred sites. And we have various DOE orders or policies that they brought forth. So what this did, all these things did, again, like I said, is it brought the federal government uh, to the table with the tribes and, and it began the trust responsibility with the recognition of the Fort Bridger Treaty and the I guess you would call it the power that it carried to bring them to the table and negotiate with us and, and talk with us. So out of all these things, the Department of Energy of Idaho, execution of that government to government relationship produced a document and it's called an agreement in, in principle now. Then it was called a working agreement and it first started in 1992. And this, this picture up here was very significant. I, I believe that was, taken when this original working agreement was was drafted and signed. Is that right, Larray? Yes. So that's our councilman there at that time. And I, I want to say that's Kesley Edmo that signed that. And I don't know the the uh, INEL director name or title, but that's where it all started from. And so with these agreements and principles, they started going, they identified five years and, and we'll try to renew. That's our time frame that we're gonna kind of update everything that we're going through. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So here we are now. This is where the cultural resources department comes into play. Um, 
that's the back history of where we were at. And now this, this department, the cultural resources, the HEDO program that I work with, uh, we work with the Department of Energy of Idaho is the title. We work with the federal, the state, and the private entities. And that's agreed and identified in this document called the Agreement in Principle. Both parties will work with the federal, state, and tribal laws regarding cultural resources issues at the INEL. Or INL. You have to excuse me. I just remember it with the E in there. E. So I got to take that out. The National Environmental Policy Act involvement. Um, and we've got access to sacred sites and ceremonial areas. So that, in a nutshell, is the cultural resources program, kind of a real short statement of what we do. Again, you got Larray here, which is my my supervisor, and Anna up here, and she's printing, presenting with me, and I also work with Carolyn uh, Smith, and I'm not sure that she's here today, um, but I want to mention her name as well. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So another program that I work with on, not a daily, but we are in the same building, and, and we do have the input into our agreement and principal plan. Um, is the environmental monitoring program. And I want to say thanks to Jamie, uh, Eagle Speaker. Uh, she's, she's, I believe, the head of that, that program there, uh, leads on the daily directions. And, and she, she, you know, reached out and opened up to me as being, a, being here a few weeks and, and helped me out understanding a few things. And so I want to tell her thank you. Jamie, um, she's sitting right here in the front row. Um, if there's anything that I mistake, feel free to correct me. Um, so they they monitor the cold granule sampling, water sampling at the INEL site, also on reservation soil sampling. And with those documents, that information, they share between our, our departments and their departments. Is that correct? And then they, they build a history of where we're at and what we're facing for any issues or concerns that might be at hand. Is that correct? Okay, next slide. <laughs> we also work with the air quality program here. Um, and in that agreement, they've agreed to support that, that monitoring program here on the reservation. Um, it's also known as the environmental monitoring station. And I want to mention the staff that works with them, um, Lori Howe, Shana Martin, uh, Leela Abrahamson, and Joey De La Cruz. Um, I work with them in the LTS program, that long-term stewardship program that I was talking about. And so, as you can see, each one of these programs provides feedback uh, to that agreement and principal plan. And that's how we put it all together to represent the Shoshone Bannock tribes and their concerns and their issues uh, for anything that's gonna be happening out there or for any activities that's gonna be coming from them out there. I wanna say that um, I've worked previously with Leela and Joey before, and I look forward to working with them as well. Shana, I work forward to working with her. Um, she surprised me, she's got some very strong uh, leadership skills and speaking skills. I would have put her here in this spot instead of me. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So our energy resources program, Elena Baldwin, um, she's here to de help develop um, future, future plans or future projects that could possibly come in place. And she's got a unique ability to, to go to places on behalf of the INEL to support that um, in any shape, form, or fashion that she would probably propose to them. Uh, we have a few of those plans on the docket and some of the things that I will be doing on a daily basis, just to let you know, would be like surveying your site for some of those items that would be a concern. So we've got four departments. We put those plans in place to fulfill our end of the agreement in principle with the Department of Energy and the INL. Go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. So as you can see here, um, this is a picture of a conference that they had this year, I believe, it says here in Las Vegas. And 
these guys uh, do a lot of work. I really didn't know what I was getting myself into with everything that they're um, they're facing um, and that they're studying, they're analyzing, they're surveying. Uh, so my hat's off to them because I'm learning a lot at a tremendous rate and uh, it's a real eye opener. But these departments here, under the framework of the 2023 agreement and principle, and um, that's actually not correct. That's a 2022 agreement and principle that was just renewed last year. They're working with the DOE and the contractors to provide feedback, concerns, travel views, travel views, and consultation to a broad spectrum of issues and interests of the Shoshone Bannock tribes upholding our end of the agreement with the 2022 agreement of principle, the LTS plan and the DOE of Idaho. And I wanted to say thank you for listening to what I had to say. If you have any questions, I would do my best to answer you or refer you to the best person that could. Otherwise I'll pass the time. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and get started with my presentation. Uh, Zandabe, Larray, Bill, Nani, Nani, Naniha. Um, good afternoon. My name is Larray Bill. I am the um, the tribe's cultural resource specialist under the Heritage Tribal Office. Next slide. Um, as um, Kyle stated, the Keto program we work with the, uh, closely with the. INL or DOE, DOE Idaho and their contractor, um, Battelle Energy Alliance, and they are the cultural resources and archaeological contractors. Um, and we um, participate in the cultural resources working groups, monthly meetings. Um, we do project reviews with DOE. Um, we do site visits. We also do yearly monitoring of important um, cultural sites on the INL. Um, we participate in archaeological surveys along with the archaeologists. Um, once in a great while, we do archaeological testing, uh, meaning data recovery, but um, we frown upon data recovery because when they're removing um, archaeological material, our material from sites just to maybe it'll be a like mitigation for a project um i always tell them that you're removing our history when you remove those items and you put them in a curation facility locking them up so nobody sees them ever again maybe maybe once in a while somebody will want to um, do research on those archaeological items, but I call data recovery and um, the curation, I call it um, legal looting, because when you do data recovery, you have to get a, ARP, a ARPA permit, um, and which is through federal law, and so that that's, that's going, doing a legal permit, and so that's where I came up with legal looting. Next slide. And so with our project reviews um, on the INL, we do have to follow, well, we ensure DOE Idaho follows all cultural resources federal laws, uh, mainly the section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act um, and ensure they follow DOE's cultural resources management plan. Um, in that plan, there's um, three levels to that plan. Um, the first level is the technical communication for project reviews, and that is done with staff. And then level two is when, if a project has a potential to affect any cultural resources. And when I'm talking about cultural resources, I'm not only talking about archeological, I'm talking about plants, the view shed, the landscape, um, and then if we cannot come to agreement on a project, then it's elevated to the third level, which is government to government, which will be um, the Dewey Idaho leaders. They come to the table with 
our leadership, the Fort Hall Business Council, and also at level three, the NAGPRA, if any human remains or items of cultural patrimony are discovered, and then we that gets automatically taken to level three and gets consulted with the, our leadership. Um, next slide. So we have site visits regularly. Um, we visit staff visits, propose um, project sites along with their project manager managers, um, the DOE culture resources staff, um, and the project contractors. Um, we also do a lot of interaction with the contractor for the projects, um, and we request uh, project plans, um, and they are given to us. Um, if they're not classified. Um, the top picture is a, of a site visit on, on the INL and we're discussing um, possible vegetation replanting to a site. Um, the site has, is a very large archeological site. Um, the, and it's deflating, meaning the wind blown is, um, the windblown soil is exposing archaeological material that is subsurface. And also in that area, there was a lot of grazing because INL allows some grazing on the site from uh, BLM. And the bottom picture is a, a BLM, DOE, and um, tribal staff um, visiting an archaeological site just off the INL, um, which is included in a uh, one of our projects, a big project we're doing right now. It's called a pre-contact context, and so we're with that context, we're evaluating and getting information on archaeological sites, campsites, just all kinds of information that we're going to put into a document, and which will be only um, shared within. Um, DOE Cultural Resources Management and the tribes. Next slide. We also do monitoring, yearly monitoring of um, significant, significant cultural sites on the INL. And we monitor yearly to make sure that um, none of the sites are impacted by unauthorized visitation, um, maybe animal impacts um, and before when I first started in the cultural resources program um, we only uh, monitored maybe five sites and it's been increased to 15 sites now and the list is just growing every year when we do these um, surveys and the left picture is um, a picture of staff um, visiting um, a middle butte cave it's a lava tube on the INL, and it's very important to us. Uh, the right top picture is of Kyle doing a survey. <laughs> and then the bottom picture is of Anna Bowers. She's um, monitoring inside a cave. And we have to wear Tyvek and suit up when we go inside caves because of the, um, the bite nose bat syndrome. Next slide. Um, tribal access. So historically, the DOE lands, um, it was a area where we hunted, gathered in a lot of the, some areas on the INL were used for ceremonial purposes. And we also, the INL was also a corridor where tribal people traveled to um, hunting and gathering and fishing um, areas north and west of the INL. Um, the top right picture is of Anna trying a, a, a plant out on, that grows a lot out on the INL. Um, desert parsley. <laughs> it's, it's very bitter, but. <laughs> um, and then the bottom left picture is just an overview, overview picture of <clears throat> the Twin Buttes or a big Southern Butte which is a very um, significant um, B 
attribute to us, although it is sitting just off the INL on BLM lands. Um, a lot, the middle picture is of wild onions and there's a lot of wild onions that grow on the INL. And the right bottom picture is of big southern bill also. Next slide. And our program also does a lot of community and tribal involvement. Um, we take um, tribal members, we try to schedule tribal member um, visits to the INL to um, certain sites of importance. Um, we also take, have special um, site visits for our business council, um, which shows on the top right, we had our council go, took them out to go visit um, Middle Butte Cave. We also participate in um, public um, tours, like with the Citizens Advisory Board, the State and Tribal Government Working Group, um, the STEM group. Um, DOE has a STEM program and they work a lot. Every They have a program every summer for students. So the, um, the bottom left picture is a picture of those students. We took them to a little hill on the INL and um, did a, they did, they got to do a mock survey. We gave them pin flags and they got to walk around and just put them flags down on any tool or um, obsidian flake or anything they thought was of significance. And they really liked that. And the bottom right picture is of um, myself, one of the archeologists and of Louise's granddaughter, she found a nice point when she was doing her little survey. And the, we also participate in the INL's um, Earth Day events. So we have meetings starting in May or March, sorry, in March to help plan with their um, STEM coordinator events on the INL. And we visit um, archeological sites with the STEM students. Um, and then we have like a powwow afterwards in the afternoon. And our program participates along with other tribal members that we invite. Um, next slide. Um, the next, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show a video that was created by the HITO program. Um, we were funded, this is before my time, we were funded in the late 90s from DOE for it's called Closing the Circle and various DOE tribes got this funding to create some kind of project. So we decided to create a video and, and it's called They Couldn't Go Through There. Um, a lot of the tribal staff were involved and tribal members were involved in the video. The video was completed in 2002 and we showed it in 2004 to the state and tribal government working group in Denver. And then just this past May, we showed it to the 2023 spring meeting. And that um, session, it was a tribal access session because um, DOE tribes have a lot of issues with gaining access to the DOE sites because it seems like they're put on um, really close to tribal reservations or their important areas. Um, and the, the, um, director, our past director, Diana, not, she was the one who decided what we were going to show. So we were all involved in creating this video. And so I guess we'll start the video now. They couldn't go through there. The birds in the sky and the wind in the grass told us the earth was our gift from the Father and it belongs to all. Since time immemorial, our people traveled across this land. It was this land that provided us with food, medicines, shelter, and our identity as a culture. This land provided shelter as we traveled back and forth between our hunting and fishing grounds. 
Other family bands that inhabited areas to the north also used this land as a stopover point. I remember uh, some of the stories that my grandmother was telling about uh, uh, when the cavalry was chasing the people from the uh, western part of Idaho, uh, Eagle Eyes Band. That they had to come, and they, they had to sneak through those areas, but they couldn't find them because the, the people that had gone, that, were, that they were chasing, they knew of the area and they knew that there were caves there. And uh, in fact, they hid from the cavalry by going into one of those caves and they hid from them for a long period of time. And uh, the cavalry couldn't find them at all. Traveling through the lava fields on the Snake River Plain was passed down from generation to generation as to which was the easiest and safest route. Tribes believed the fierceness of volcanics was the continuing of creation. The tribe knew it was hot, but didn't feel threatened. They saw it as creation and utilized it to suit their migratory needs. They go there one season, they go to there, and next season the, they come back again, same way, and they go back there again. Because it's their natural route to go back and forth. Some people are using it for, like uh, they're looking for a uh, be a medicine man. And they, they dressed up for it and uh, they lay, lay there for one night so they could get their power from that, uh, underneath that butte someplace. In 1942, the United States government established the Naval Proving Ground where weapons and munitions were field tested. The outcome of this action was we were denied access to the land that was important to our way of life. On this land we gathered plants and roots which provided us with food and medicine. We also used this land as a migratory path going north and west to our salmon harvesting grounds and to the camas prairie to the south to gather camas bulbs and other roots. <laughs> The three buttes were also significant to our people based on sacred and religious aspects. What I remember is when we leave from Blackfoot, it takes us three nights to get to How? Three nights. We sleep at three different places just get to how. The last one is right on the that river, Lost River. That's where the crossing is at. I have to cross at that one place. After the United States government restricted the land, we could no longer travel through our Aboriginal lands and use it as we had in the past. The government turned part of the land into a test firing area for relined guns from the Naval Ordnance Plant in Pocatello before the guns were placed on ships and submarines. Personnel were also trained for wartime efforts. During that time, the land was also utilized as a bombing range for the armed services and later a nuclear reactor research station. The Navy Nuclear Research Program was designed to provide research and technology for the United States Navy Nuclear Program. People knew, you know, heard it was supposed to be gun range. And then my sister and, his, and her husband, they traveled through there towards the how there, and the road was closed. They came after them and told them they couldn't go through there. As World War II came to a close, the site stayed involved in nuclear research as the United States and the Soviet Union engaged in a half-century Cold War. However, transporting the guns from the NOP, which was built on the Shoshone Bandic tribe's ceded lands, to the Naval Proving Grounds meant traveling across the Fort Hall Indian Reservation and Aboriginal lands. Besides rail transportation, the Pocatello Air Base was also used. This air base was then and still is located on the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. 
although compensation for the use of these right-of-ways still remains an issue. The gun plant and the site were and continue to be a source of employment for tribal members. Indian men and women fought and served the United States in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and Desert Storm before and after becoming United States citizens. As of 2002, the site remains restricted to the public as well as the Shoshone-Bannock tribes, although the United States Department of Energy has entered into agreements with the Shoshone-Bannock tribes beginning with the 1992 Working Agreement. The 1992 Working Agreement between the Shoshone-Bannock tribes and the United States Department of Energy was the development of a working relationship between the two parties. The principle for the working agreement was to provide opportunity for the tribes to maintain oversight, participation, and monitoring of activities performed on the INEEL. The agreement also assured the protection of the health, safety, and the welfare of the tribes, its members, and the residents of the Fort Hall Indian Reservation, the tribe's ceded and aboriginal territories. Tribal culture endured changes over several thousand years as a result of the loss of land. We once traveled freely between our winter camps and our traditional gathering and hunting areas. Our lifestyles and migratory routes are now limited and restricted due to the creation of what is now the Idaho National Engineering and Environmental Laboratory. Our connection with Mother Earth remains strong and true. The agreements the tribes entered into with the Department of Energy is a starting point to closing an unyielding circle between our people, the Earth's resources, and the United States government's laws and regulations. Can the resources of Mother Earth live in harmony with a government that's constantly making changes? So that video had a lot of tribal elders that are no longer with us, and, and I'm just glad that they um, did the interviews. <clears throat> so, um, so the protection and preservation of our history, our cultural material is very important in having access to our important sites on the INL, not only on the INL, but on also other federal lands. Um, this picture shows is why tribal programs or culture resources needs to have oversight in protecting and preserving our sites. Um, this picture is a a cave just off the Fort Hall Reservation boundary on BLM lands, and as you can see, it's very um, it doesn't look good. It's all tagged up. And so, and then I um, hiked up there because it's way up on the top side of a hill. And we found, we actually did, I happened to look down and I found a obsidian lake. So there probably is um, 
subsurface material, but people go there and party and stuff like that, which is not cool at all. Next slide. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, next up is Anna Bowers. Hello, my name is Anna Bowers, and I'm a cultural resource technician for Shoshone-Bannock Tribe. Um, not only do we do uh, surveying and archaeological work, we also do research. And this research took us to one of our tribal members who's an elder, highly respected, and his wife was we just, I went and asked her, gave her my, um, what I needed to do, and and she brought this to us. She brought her husband to us. Next slide. Traditional Seasonal Rounds by Frederick Ock, Shoshone-Bannock Tribal Elder. Next slide. The Will of Life. The medicine wheel is the wheel of life. This is life and months in each year as well as each season has three months. Days and morning and night. The circle has no end because this is creator's creation. This symbolizes the sun, moon, and earth, and eternity. This is why humans have round heads, because Creator oops, wanted us to live a long time. The earth is brown, just like our skin color. It is said the ice blocks north and south pole make the earth go round. This will is the life map for our people. We must live by the will in a soft, loving manner. This will continue on for generations. The ingredients to life, will and eternity, harmony, respect, and discipline is our Diniwap. Always respect the self first. Creator taught us, taught each tribe it, this teaching. That is why there are so many tribes, 300 plus. If you live by this, you will live a long life and many generations. And the slide will always, oops. Can you go back? Will always be a circle. This is creator's symbol. He made this, this has four colors. That represents the seasons. Start with red spring, symbolizes sunrise and at the top of the circle, always the east side. Months are March, April, May. In a clockwise motion, next is yellow or blue, depending on who prefers. Summer months are June, July, and August. This is the south side. Bottom is black, fall. Months are September, October, November, always the west side. North side is white, winter. Months are December, January, and February. Next slide, please. Life menu. Hunting and gathering circle. If you talk to your flint, it will get an ant, get the animal. For large game, they will be ready to eat in the fall. That is when the young ones, animals born in the spring, will be able to take care of themselves. All the animals know what they are made for. Always cedar yourself and cedar and others when going to go hunt. Animals hunted, grouse, hunt, grouse hunted at Mud Lake, Medicine Lodge area, anywhere where there is short sagebrush, 
hunted in the early morning, get to the area before sunrise, then lay a blanket and stay still and wait for the sun to rise. Once the sun has rose, the sage grouse will start dancing. The old ones ate the pouch. It has power properties. Hunting time this early spring, March and April during mating season. Antelope, to know if the antelope is a female or male is to look by the ear. There will be a black dot under the ear. The right way to prepare the ant antelope is to cut the throat to end the life. To show respect to the animal after cutting the throat you let it bleed into the earth. You prepare the animal right where its life ended. Leave the guts in the spot. The liver, the leaves. This leaves food for the other animals, such as coyotes, birds, wolves, various carnivore animals. Not a lot of people like to eat the antelope because the meat is strong. The meat is strong because it wasn't skinned right. They have very delicate hide. The right way to skin this animal is to roll the hide as you go. The meat is strong because of the skin. Yaha, the rock chuck, is harvested late spring, May, found living by the lava rocks. You have to stay still and they will come out. Whistle like how they do to grab their attention. Once dead, gut the yaha where you killed it. The liver has a white blister, cut that out. So sew back up with either wire or willows. Yaha are cooked in the ground, skin and all. Bury the bury in the ground, but lay on top of but lay on top of alfalfa. Cover the Cover with dirt and rocks. Let it cook for three hours. Also, during this time, wild onions are ready to be harvested. If you can grab some wild onions while yaha, is, while yaha hunting, this cooks really well with the yaha. Zangaman. Rabbits. Used to roam all over the Snake River Plain. No longer because of agriculture. You can snare... Sn Sneep, seep with a small wire or rope. To get this animal, you have to find their tracks because they use the small trails in the snow and attach snare in the, in the trail underneath the, a sagebrush. Fred talks of, time, of a time when rabbits used to be plentiful. He and others would go to Gibson, Trusha, Bronco Road, and do rabbit drive. There would be people walking along the edges and then the people in the middle had the guns and would kill the rabbits. <clears throat> Elk, this animal is very powerful. You have to get to understand this animal because it will play tricks on you. However, the elk will bless you. Put the blood back into mother earth, moose. The moose is slow animal. Not a lot of people will eat it because of the meat is tough. If you treat it right, the fur will tan easily and the meat will be soft. Ducks, late fall and winter is when, the, when to harvest these animals. You can scare the animal to the edge of the water to catch. You can also eat the duck eggs, yeast, you can store the, the goose in the cellar. This can, be a, this can be a long staple food if kept in the dark. Buffalo, the bannock followed the buffalo. The last wild buffalo was killed in Ross Fork. Salmon, steelhead, early to mid spring, they would go to Yankee Fork and would wait a few days to let the agai spawn. You could tell when they spawned, that is when you would harvest them. These fish would grow in the, in the ocean, but will always come back to their home. When gutting, the, when gutting the agai, one has to leave the guts. 
back into the water or near by so the other animals could eat. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Plants gathered, choke cherries, camas bulbs, bitterroot, tobacco, apples, little sagebrush. Next slide, please. Slide six, hunting trails and migration patterns. Buffalo, the Bannock would follow the buffalo. From Oregon all the way to Montana, there was an old buffalo trail near American Falls. Malad was not a travel route. The old ones would travel underground. There was a travel corridor near Bone and would go all the way to Camers Prairie. There also is another one from Ross Fort to Bear River area. This one is right by the road. So don't tell anyone highly sensitive information, he said. Spring water gives life. All life follows the stream. When winter comes, when winter came, some would camp from Pocatello all the way to the Buttes. This was one of the wintering areas. There was lots of people. And I'm just gonna go to the end. <laughs> the trail was taken depend, depends on who was leading. Paiute meant water rises. Saidika meant water tulis. This is the Arapahos. Banics were banite. This means from above. Everyone knew each other. Majority of the people were from Shoshone. The majority of the people were Shoshone. Fred also talks to the Comanche, talks of the Comanches living here in the Ferry Butte. They would come to the Ferry Butte and camp then head through the Tetons. Fred said there was an Indian name for the Tetons, but not to say it when traveling through because that, because that name and the mountain holds great power and it could harm you. Next slide. Thank you, Fred Ock, Shoshone tribal elder for this personal communication. And I'd like to recognize Zavelda Ock would you please stand? She is our tr Shoshone Bannock tribal elder and archivist, and she's very instrumental in towards the completion of this interview. Thank you, Velda. There is more, but I had to cut it short. <laughs> okay. Almost done. We have one little prize for a trivia question. Um, what was the document that the DOE Idaho and the Shoshone Bannock tribes signed together. And what year? The first document. Susan? Susan? Correct. Um, go get your prize from Louise. She has it. 